careful to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that. We're all mad here. I'm mad, you're mad. How do you know that I'm mad? You must be, or you wouldn't have come here. Hi, I'm Cheshire, and if it wasn't already obvious, the only place I've ever truly felt safe is Wonderland. So, I'm going to talk about it. And what is the use of a book without pictures or conversations? Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is a children's story written by Lewis Carroll in 1865, followed a few years later in 1871 by Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There, because Mr Carroll couldn't have kept things short. If by some chance you're watching this and truly know nothing about Alice, here's the briefest synopsis I can give. In another moment, down went Alice after it, never once considering how in the world she was to get out again. Alice, a seven-year-old girl, follows a white rabbit who is late and falls down a rabbit hole. She finds herself in Wonderland and meets some very mad creatures, has some unbelievable experiences and wakes up. The end. In Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there, the same Alice goes, well, through a looking glass and finds herself in a world where everything has been reversed. Much like in Alice's first adventure, she meets some very mad creatures, has some unbelievable experiences and wakes up. The end. Who are you? I... I hardly know, sir. Just at present, at least... I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is one of, if not the most, adapted stories ever. And I don't just mean adapted into films and TV and the like. I mean countless things have taken inspiration from Carol's story literary retellings and sequels, as well as literature that is obviously alluding to Alice. And I don't just mean literature in the way of books, I also mean comics and graphic novels, film and TV, theatre performances, characters, music, video games, tourist attractions, even food. In science! You can truly find Alice in Wonderland anywhere you look. So where did it all start? But what am I to do? Anything you like. Oh, there's no use in talking to him, he's perfectly idiotic. If you weren't aware, Lewis Carroll was only a pen name for Reverend Charles Dodgson, who in 1856 became friends with Henry Little and his family. During a river trip on the 4th of July, 1862, Dodgson told the little girls Alice, Lorena and Edith the story about a little girl named Alice who is bored and goes looking for an adventure. The girls adored the story so much that Alice asked Dodgson to write it down for her and he did. On the 26th of November 1864 Dodgson presented the manuscript to Alice. It was titled A Christmas Gift to a Dear Child in Memory of a Summer's Day. Alice Little kept the manuscript and treasured it until 1928 where she was forced to sell it. Although 20 years later, it found its way back to the British Museum. This manuscript is commonly known as Alice's Adventures Underground and is now kept at the British Library. After Dodgson had given this manuscript to Alice, he was encouraged by many of his friends to publish the story. And obviously, he did. He expanded the story, removed the original references to the little family, and added in the Cheshire Cat and the iconic Mad Tea Party. The classic illustrations many would be familiar with were done by John Tenniel. Some drawings, like the Pool of Tears, were based off of Carol's own designs, whereas other drawings, like the Mad Hatter and the March Hare, were Tenniel's own designs. The story was published as Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in 1865 under the name Lewis Carroll. And in 1871, Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There was published, the illustrations once again being done by John Tenniel. See, and this was the story to gain extensive popularity, and it brought back attention and appreciation to the original story. Speaking of appreciation for the original story, once it started, it didn't stop, not even from Carol himself. Carol wrote The Nursery Alice in 1890, which was a shortened version of his story for children aged 0 to 5. This was not simply a shortened version of the story, it was written to be read aloud to children, having questions and pointing out details of characters and moments. There are so many other versions of Alice in Wonderland that it would take an inordinate amount of time to go through it all. But I would like to go through a few. Would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to. I don't much care where, then it doesn't matter which way you go. So long as I get somewhere. 
A New Alice in the Old Wonderland is a short novel written by Anna M. Richards in 1895. The lead is Alice Lee, an American girl who finds herself in Wonderland and meets all the strange characters we are already acquainted with. The illustrations were done by her daughter and were based very directly on Tenniel's original designs. While the story is not quite as adventurous as the original and all the poetic devices that litter Carol's works have been completely left out, it is very obviously a love letter to the original Wonderland. So for the first known version of putting a different spin on the tale, you can't fold it too much. Gladys in Gremmeland is the first known parody of Carol's work. Written in 1897 by Audrey Mayhew Allen, it stars Gladys who is taken to Gremmeland, where she meets Verbs and is imprisoned for using bad grammar. She studies while well in prison and gets released so that she can mediate a dispute between King Proper Noun and King Common Noun. <laughs> it's parody and educational. What more is there to say? In 1984, 113 years after Through the Looking Glass was published, Gilbert Adair wrote a third book in the Alice series. Alice Through the Needle's Eye, a third adventure for Lewis Carroll's Alice. It consists of Alice travelling through the alphabet and just like in the original two tales, she wakes at the end, finding it all a dream. There are direct references to Carroll's works, for example Dinah appears at the beginning and in the labyrinth, spelt like this. <sighs> Alice follows a rabbit through a hole. Going into slightly more modern literature, The Looking Glass Wars, written in 2006 by Frank Bedore, depicts an alternate Alice, implying that Carol distorted the true story. The books follow familiar characters, but in new and different roles. It's a trilogy! <laughs> And that's only briefly touching on some literature, not even close to the majority of it. But how about film? The first film adaptation was titled Alice in Wonderland and was directed by Cecil Hepworth and Percy Stowe. It was made in 1903 and was 12 minutes long. There is only one copy of it which is a 9 minute restoration done by the British Film Institute in 2010. You can find it on YouTube. It is most memorable for its use of special effects, specifically Alice shrinking and growing bigger and Alice and the Cheshire Cat disappearing. For 1903 they were pretty impressive effects but maybe that's just the black and white disguising things. For the Cheshire Cat they used a real cat and I just find that really funny because the March Hare and the White Rabbit are obviously actors in costumes but for the Cheshire Cat it's just a real cat. For a 9 minute restoration it's pretty good at including most of the story. Alice falling asleep, seeing the white rabbit and following it down a rabbit hole, the hall of many doors, the white rabbit's house, the duchess, the baby turning into a pig, the Cheshire cat, mad tea party, the queen of hearts procession which was just a lot of cards, Alice causing a commotion and the cards being dissatisfied at this, Alice waking up. Look there are plenty of books that have much worse adaptations so take note sometimes your best bet might just be to make a 12 minute silent film. I would also like to make a quick mention of the 1915 silent film directed by W.W. W. Young because despite it being 52 minutes it cuts out the entirety of the Mad Tea Party but adds a subplot where Alice is craving tarts before she enters Wonderland. I just think that's pretty interesting. Most people I asked tended to say that the Mad Tea Party was the most iconic part of Alice in Wonderland so the fact that they just completely cut it out? I just think that's pretty gutsy. It would be remiss of me not to mention the 1951 Walt Disney animated film of Alice in Wonderland. The film was the first introduction to Alice in Wonderland to many, many people. It was mine. The film takes elements from both Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and combines them in a way that almost feels seamless. I think Disney's Alice in Wonderland has a very interesting history. I could make a whole separate video going through the history, but I'll try to get through this as quickly and succinctly as possible. In 1923, Disney along with Ub Iwerks and their staff made a 10 minute short called Alice's Wonderland. Like most things that have taken inspiration from Alice, it stars a little girl named Alice who enters a cartoon studio and witnesses the cartoons being created. That night she dreams of being in the cartoon world. This short was never released but it paved the way for the Alice comedies to be made. These were all 10 minute shorts about this Alice having different adventures in the cartoon world. Alice was a real little girl, she was a real actor while the rest of the world was animation and at this point in time this was a very new and unique idea. Four different little girls played Alice over the years. Virginia Davis, Margie Gay, Dawn O'Day and Lois Hardwick. 
57 episodes of the Alice comedies were made, but after the initial idea of Alice going into a separate world, there's not really any other inspiration taken from Alice in Wonderland. Walt Disney's next attempt at adapting Alice in Wonderland was in the 1930s, but that was unsuccessful. He revived the idea in the 40s and planned on making it live action crossed with animation, just like in the Alice comedies, but in 1946 he decided on a completely animated film. On its initial release in 1951, it was considered a disappointment and critically panned. So Disney showed it on television as one of the first episodes of Disneyland, an anthology television series, in 1954. This proved to be successful and it got re-released in cinemas and this proved to be a massive success. It is now regarded as one of Disney's greatest animated films and is the biggest cult classic in the animation medium. What a turnaround, am I right? That of course was not the only adaptation done by Disney, there is the Tim Burton 2010 film. The costumes were designed by Colleen Atwood and they're amazing. Phenomenal. And that's all I have to say about that. There was a made-for-TV film done in 1999 and this film is interesting because it was the last film production to directly adapt the books. Other productions since then have either been sequels or reimaginings. This film won four Emmys for costume design, makeup, music composition and visual effects. I know award shows shouldn't mean anything but there's that. It's kind of disappointing that this was a made-for-TV film because I think if it had been released in cinemas it'd be a lot more popular than it is. The film utilises puppetry which makes me automatically biased towards it. The designs were created by Jim Henson's Creature Shop. Miranda Richardson plays the Queen of Hearts, Whoopi Goldberg plays the Cheshire Cat. I just think everybody should see this adaption at least once. Another one that I should mention that was introduced to me by an Alice is Alice, directed by Jan Schwankmeier. It was a 1998 Czech film originally titled, forgive me, Neko zi Alenki, meaning something from Alice. It combines live action with stop motion and is a much creepier take on the story, far from the usual whimsy of Wonderland. The White Rabbit, Mad Hatter, Cheshire Cat, they're all still present in the story, but the presentation of everything is a little bizarre. The characters are now unsettling because on top of the stop motion, which a lot of people already find creepy, they're played by taxidermied animals and puppets and other assorted objects. I know many people are put off by stop motion, like I mentioned, but if you're not, I think this is a good watch. There are only four direct-to-video adaptations, but the only reason I'm bringing it up is because the first two, count them, two, are Australian. I mean, look, I've barely scratched the surface of Alice in film, but I do have to move on at some point. To the theatre! <laughs> there are so, so, so many versions of Alice in theatre. And if you don't understand why, it's because you don't have to pay for the rights. Like Shakespeare, they're copyright free. Where do you even start? <laughs> there are a few musicals, but I'll only talk about two. Wonder Dot Land and Alice by Heart. Both are very different interpretations and settings, despite both revolving around a teenager Alice. Wonder Dot Land, music by Damon Albarn, book and lyrics by Moira Buffini, is about Ali, who is fed up with her life. She seeks solace online and comes across Wonder Dot Land, an online world where she can be whoever she wants. She creates her avatar, Alice. The story mainly focuses around online personas versus real life. The show has been praised for its use of projection, which is amazing, but has been largely criticised on its music and narrative. It was well received in Paris though. I am very fond of the costume design in the show. The White Rabbit is just interesting to look at. It's... it feels really innovative and different. It's an interesting take on the story, and truthfully, Ali is one of the most relatable Alices I've seen. Alice by Heart was done by Duncan Sheik and Stephen Sater, most well known for Spring Awakening. This is a very different take on the story, taking place during World War II. 
It's about Alice Spencer, who's forced to hide with her best friend Alfred in a shelter. The two of them escape into their copy of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. The show has been described as disjointed and depressing. You wouldn't know what's going on unless you were well acquainted with the original source material. Despite that, many of the performances were praised, and the soundtrack is quite beautiful. There are many other theatre shows of Alice in Wonderland, including plays. Gladys in Gremmerland even got its own play. I've been involved with two different theatre productions. I was part of the crew for my high school's production. I still have paint in this ring from set painting. For that version of the story, Lewis Carroll was a character in the story, and the opening took place in Alice's house. Um, the students who played uh, her mother and father also played the King and Queen of Hearts. I think the maid played the Duchess, but it was a long time ago. And just this year, I was in Bach Theatre Company's production of Alice. It was a similar take to Wonder.Land, where Wonderland was the internet, but still very, very different. We even had projection in ours. It was an ensemble piece, and we all put a lot of work into it. I played the March Hare. It was a fun time. I miss those guys. <laughs> According to the audience, it was very good, but I was in the show, so I can't really say. Alice in Theatre doesn't stop there, though. There are also operas and ballets, but I have been going on about this for a while. So here are some quick mentions. In Batman, the villains Mad Hatter and Tweedledum and Tweedledee are direct references to Alice, and Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth is loosely based on Carol's works. Heart no Kuni no Alice, Pandora Hearts, Alice in Murderland, and Alice in Borderland are manga series based both directly and loosely on Carol's works. Marvel Fairy Tales is a basic retelling of the story, with Cassie Lang playing Alice, and there being Wonderland versions of The Young Avengers and Scott Lang. American McGee's Alice and the sequel, Alice Madness Returns, are macabre video games tackling psychological issues based on the story. There are also several one-offs in popular media based on the tale, some being Betty in Wonderland in the Betty and Veronica comics, Lisa's Adventures in Wordland in The Simpsons, CL in Wonderland, the two-part Black Butler OVA, and an episode of the Hello Kitty OVA. VA, where all the characters are a lot nicer to her than they were to Alice. There are also plenty of references in music, be it song titles, band names, music videos. Alice truly is everywhere. But even after all that, I do want to delve into one more retelling, because it's my favourite. Haruhi in Wonderland is episode 13 of the Oran High School Host Club anime, and volume 4, chapter 15 of the manga. I can't necessarily pin down exactly why it's my favourite, but for a 20 minute episode of a reverse harem anime, it hits almost every important aspect of the original story while still keeping it very set in the Auron universe. I've loved the episode since the moment I saw it, but I didn't realize how good it was until, well, until I started talking about this video to, to my Takashi. <laughs> The characterizations of all the Auron characters we know are the same. They're all consistent, while also being a pretty accurate adaptation of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Our lead sees an unusual rabbit, follows it, falls down a hole. She needs to shrink to fit through a door. Eating causes a size change. Skittish mouse, pool of tears, confusing caterpillar, mushroom sides, the duchess, the cook, the baby who is not a baby, infuriating Cheshire cat, Dodo. Tea party, where there is in fact plenty of room. Hatter, hair, mouse. Riddle, question mark? Courtroom. It was all a dream. Yet, things are changed for the purpose of the anime itself. For example, Haruhi does not cry the pool of tears in the episode. Instead, the pool of tears exists as a culmination of all the tears she has cried in her life. That makes sense. It's changed in a way where it can still exist, but still lines up with her character. I also love the courtroom scene because even though there are two completely different things happening in the two scenes, for storytelling purposes, the beats all line up. But then the trigger for Haruhi waking up being running to her mother is a complete change, but it works so beautifully for the story. And Honey's white rabbit costume at the end of the episode is so cute. I love it. <laughs> So what's the point I'm trying to make with all these retellings and imaginings? Well, the point that I'm trying to make is not just that they're countless, but they're also all different. They are all unique in their own way, even though we're all reading the same story. 
When asking people what their favourite adaptation or reimagining of Alice in Wonderland was, their answers mostly fell one of two ways, or they had two answers falling into these two different ways. The first reason for a favourite interpretation is usually nostalgia. This was their first introduction into Alice in Wonderland, or that piece of media has a specific feeling to it that aligns with how they think Wonderland feels. And the other reason has to do with taking the story and putting a different, usually darker, spin on the story. Of course these were not the only answers people gave, some had to do with the accuracy of adaptation, music or costumes, performances, even simply the aesthetic. But these were the common answers I found. <laughs> so we like the feeling of Wonderland, the whimsy and the nonsense, but we also enjoy being able to change the story to make it more relatable to us in our present day lives. That makes sense. And that's the conclusion I've come to on why it's been adapted and retold so many times. Everyone who enters Wonderland understands it in a different way and feels the need to tell it that way. And that's an important thing to consider when speaking about why it's so loved. So why? Why Wonderland? I believe I can guess that. Do you mean you think you can find the answer to it? Exactly so. Then you should say what you mean. I do. At least I mean what I say. Finally getting to the title of the video. Why? The simple answer is people find comfort in a place where they're allowed to be different. I know that's the answer to why Wonderland, but my question is more about why it's persisted the way it has. There are other fictional lands where you're allowed to be different, encouraged to be different, but none of them are Wonderland. Now I'm not the be all end all of Alice knowledge, I am aware of that, I'm just somebody who is way too attached to the story. <laughs> And I understand why I'm attached to not just the story, but Wonderland as a place. But I'm certain my reasons do not align with everybody else's reasons. And yet we all find comfort in Wonderland. Sure, I could just ask people why, but even that won't truly give me an answer. There are more people attached to Wonderland than I could ask, because some people just won't answer me. But I did get some answers from actual people. <laughs> But as someone who always felt different to people, Wonderland felt like a place where I could belong. We're all mad here. Those are the words I found comfort in because if we're all mad, then I'm not being excluded for being different. It's awful to be singled out just for being weird. But part of Wonderland's comfort isn't just in the world itself, it's also in the cast of characters. In both Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. I think it's possible for everyone to see themselves as someone in Wonderland. In saying those are the words I find comfort in and the name I prefer to go by, you can accurately assume that the character I think of myself as in Wonderland is the Cheshire Cat. But even if you take out the Cheshire Cat, I still have the March Hare to relate to. I attract hatters. <laughs> so just like me, I think everybody has one or more character they can relate to in Wonderland. But what did Carol intend? I've never heard of uglification. What is it? What? Never heard of uglifying? You know what to beautify is, I suppose. Yes, it means to make anything prettier. Well then, if you don't know what to uglify is, you are a simpleton. The title character is Alice, the book is called Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and through the looking glass and what Alice found there, you know who the lead is. And yet, Alice often gets overlooked. The story can't happen without her, and yet when I asked people who the most iconic characters in Alice in Wonderland are, two people said Alice first. Two. Carol wrote Alice not only as the lead, but also as the character for the audience to understand Wonderland through. Wonderland and the story only work because of Alice's experience in it. Okay, let me give a completely out there and unrelated example. In, stay with me, Kakaguri, Ryota Suzui is the main character, and yet he doesn't seem to have a good rep among fans. People have said he's boring and he's annoying because he's in love with a lesbian. But guess what? You wouldn't know what the heck is going on 
ever without him. Kakaguri needs Ryota as an audience stand-in. Reading Alice's Adventures in Wonderland is also like that, at least the first time. Alice is our somewhat logical, albeit child, audience stand-in. Her experience in Wonderland is our first experience in Wonderland. We need her. We have all been Alice, at least once in our lives. As much as we'd all like to be a mad resident of Wonderland, sometimes you're just Alice. Confused as to what's happening and the only person who is making any sense to you is you. But not always. And when you're not Alice, Wonderland still has a character for you. The mad, sad, weird, feared, they're all a part of Wonderland. They all belong there. The only person who's out of place is Alice. And yet, Alice is still a part of it. We all are. Who are we in Wonderland? We could be anybody. But ultimately, we are ourselves in Wonderland. Wonderland is a place where we can all belong. Don't let them know she likes them best. For this must ever be a secret kept from all the rest between yourself and me. That's the most important piece of evidence we've heard yet. <laughs> Why has Carol's Wonderland persisted for over 150 years? Countless retellings, references, interpretations of Alice and her Wonderland. It could be a simple answer to just say, because people love Wonderland. I could leave it at that. I'm not going to because otherwise I wouldn't have made this video, but I could. <laughs> no. Instead, I'll finish off with Wonderland is a place you can easily find yourself in, whether you're lost or just visiting or even living there. It's easy to become one with Wonderland because everybody can belong. It's almost a paradox, but being different in Wonderland is being normal. There's such a range of characters to relate to. Are you Alice and it's your first time and you're confused and maybe a little scared? Or the Cheshire Cat, confusing but always watching? Maybe you're sitting at the mad tea party, sleeping in the sugar bowl or telling unanswerable riddles. Are you painting the roses red? You could be part of an inseparable duo or think you were once a turtle. Do you ask difficult questions or are you trying to be kind but just come off as rude? Maybe you're the monstrous Jabberwocky, or maybe you're the one who slayed it with your vorpal sword. Maybe you're both. In the end, it doesn't matter who you are. You have found yourself in Wonderland just like the rest of us. Because remember, we're all mad here. Life, what is it but a dream? Thank you to everybody who has made it this far. I truly appreciate it. This is my first time doing something like this. And I think I said what I wanted to say. I got out everything in my brain at least, and this was fun. I know I can be a bit cyclical sometimes, so... I think I made my point though. <laughs> this was fun, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you to everybody who gave me their favourite opinion on adaptations and iconic imagery, including Adele, Atlas, Bianca, Blaze, Dee, Dee, Eleanor, Isabel, Ivy, J, Jess, Jordan, Julia, Nyoka, Sarah, Sabrina, and my mum for just letting me talk everything through. Alice, a childish story take, and with a gentle hand, lay it where childhood's dreams are twined, in memory's mystic band, like pilgrims, withered wreath of flowers, plucked in a far-off land.